morning. I want to thank uh, Jim Castina personally for inviting me to uh, speak this morning. I just want to give a plug for the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine. There are a few past presidents out there, Rich Blake, Steve Privet, and Tim Dutra. Uh, I also was a past president. I want to applaud my uh, opponent, if you will, this morning with this debate. Uh, it's a very, very controversial issue whether or not uh, minimalist barefoot running versus traditional shoe running is preferable. So we're going to talk a little bit about those conditions that I feel and we feel that are probably contraindicated for running barefooted, particularly, or with a minimalist type of shoe. We know those conditions such as diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, but I want to show some of the biomechanics this morning, particularly of medial calm instability, hypermobility in first grade, functional structural how its limit is rigidus, and then so on. Metatarsalogy, neuroma, metatarsis abductus, High degree of four foot varus, equinus that you've heard about, a rigid pest planus, a rigid tapus, very complex first ray. So let's talk about the medial longitudinal arch, its structure. It, it acts as a cheap load bearing structure of the foot, dependent upon the kinematics of the first ray for optimal support during gait. The first ray is a single foot structure segment consisting of the first metatarsal cuneiform bones. We talked about pronation of the subtalar joint, which lowers the first ray to the ground in early stance phase. The medial longitudinal arch acts as a chief load-bearing structure of the foot, dependent upon the kinematics of the first ray. First ray is a single foot segment consisting of the first metatarsal and cuneiform bones. We're looking at shock, both of the heel and the forefoot, particularly when, as the body weight moves forward and the mechanics of supination stabilize the medial arch, preparing the foot for a propulsive phase of gait. This dichotomous action of the weight acceptance, weight-bearing stability required in the first ray underscores the importance that we as clinicians who treat the foot understand the biomechanics of the first ray. So we know what a plantar flex first ray looks like, and how it can cause dysfunction. I think the key here is that these findings suggest that a rigid plantar flex first ray compromises the ability of the medial arch to attenuate the shock of impact during weight acceptance. So this is one condition that we have to look out for if these individuals are going to run barefoot or in minimal shoes. Failure of the first ray to plantar flex relative to the hallux, such as a hallux limitus, is another condition where, if you notice, the first metatarsal must plantar flex away from the hallux during gait. If we can't achieve that, another condition. Hallux limitus, rigidus, where, again, first ray plantar flexion may be essential to normal biomechanics of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. An unstable first ray, when it elevates, decreases that dorsiflexion of the first MP joint, particularly during the terminal or propulsive phase of gait. So again, if you're wearing a minimalist shoe, or if you're wearing a, or if you're barefooted, how are you going to be able to propulse with that jamming of the first ray and that constant battering of that joint? The importance of the first ray to the mechanics of the foot is in part because of the metatarsal cuneiform joint's location. It intersects the transverse and medial longitudinalis type of shoe or barefooted. That's the question. So you see a hallux limitus condition here with a dorsal exostosis, a jamming of the joint, limited range of motion. You see on the uh, computerized gait analysis where you have compensation veering off the first MP joint. Will that individual do well from a minimal shoe or again, a barefoot situation? As you see here with this individual's x-rays. First rate function. Because the ends of the foot are not secure at the beginning of stance, the foot functions like a beam. As the weight of the body transfers forward, the calcaneus and the heads of the metatarsal are pressed to the ground with the arch functioning as a truss. This truss and beam mechanism of the foot relies on the first ray to function as a pillar of the longitudinal arch. The first ray, therefore, is a critical element in controlling the structural integrity of the foot. We know all these things. We know them, but the question is, do we understand them well enough to be able to counsel and determine or predict which individuals would suffer an injury from a barefoot running pattern, a, whether it's a forefoot running impact pattern or a minimalist shoe. 
So we know about first ray mobility, hypermobility of the first ray. If we have a hypermobile first ray, it's not another indication or a contraindication for these shoes. We know about medial column instability. So what happened to our friends at uh, Vibram this year? Well, unfortunately, everybody knows that there was a lawsuit involved and that they did agree to a $3.37 million uh, out-of-court settlement and refunding $94 per runner who wants to bring their shoes back. So the pros and cons of minimalist running shoes. Let's look at some of the evidence-based studies. In the Journal of Sports, Medicine, and Physical Fitness, the study tried to look at the changes in the mechanical characteristics of the foot-ground interface and what they did was they looked at the running economy in eight experienced barefoot runners on a treadmill at 12 kilometers per hour. The results compared to the standard traditional shoe condition with running barefoot, the athletes landed in a more plantar flexion at the ankle. This is what was discussed first by my other speaker. This caused reduced impact forces and changes to stride in the kinematics. This caused a significantly shorter stride length and contact times and a higher stride frequency. So it's positive. I'm not saying that it can't be positive. I'm being a what I call neutral bystander in this discussion and not a naysayer in all cases. But the conclusion showed that the study supported the assumption that changes in the foot ground interface led to changes in running pattern in a group of experienced, let me write that down again, experienced barefoot runners, not newbies. The five-finger model seems to be effective in imitating the barefoot conditions while providing a small, small amount of protection. Let's go to another study. This is a very important study. The second study was about bone marrow edema experienced in runners after switching to minimalist footwear and reported in medicine and science and sports and exercise. The study looked at measuring bone marrow edema in runners' feet after a 10-week period transitioning from traditional to minimalist running shoes. 36 experienced recreational runners, MRI before and after the 10-week period, 17 in the control group with the traditional shoes, 19 in the experimental group, and then the severity of the bone marrow edema ranged from 0 to 4. 4 was a stress fracture, pretty severe. The results, pre-training MRI scores were not statistically different between the groups, but the post-training MRI sh showed that more subjects in the vibrant group, 10 of the 19, showed increases in bone marrow edema in at least one foot bone after the 10 week of running, or one in 17 in the control group. Two of the 10 injured Vibram runners developed full blown stress fractures, one in the heel, one in the second metatarsal. The conclusion of this study, the risk of foot and bone injury, runners transitioning to Vibram five fingers should take even longer, and this is really the conclusion in a lot of the research studies showing that more than 10 weeks may be necessary in order to transition from a, tradi from a traditional shoe to a minimal shoe or a uh, four-foot contact barefoot style running shoe. The study supports the idea that the minimalist shoe can strengthen the lower leg and foot muscles and the lack of shock absorbing cushioning can increase the risk of osseous injury. Well, the study also showed that at their peak mileage during that 10 week period, the traditional running shoe runners reported more average miles. They got up to 30 miles. And the vibrant runners who did not get injured, they reached 18 miles. And those vibrant runners who did get injured, only 15 miles. Arch height. My, uh, my good colleague talks about how the minimalist shoe or the vibrant type of shoe can increase longitudinal arch strength and increase height in the study that you just saw a few moments ago. Well, here's another study that was presented at the American College of Sports Medicine, which showed that transitioning from running shoes and traditional shoes to minimalist running shoes should increase muscle strength of the intrinsic foot muscles. We measured arch height before and after 10 weeks of transitioning to minimalist running shoes. Our results showed no difference in arch height after the 10 weeks in either group. The study showed that 10 weeks of transitioning to the minimal shoes did not cause a significant change in the neutral or standing arch height, concluding that the effect of minimalist running on the arch height or the injury rates is either negligible or requires a longer exposure time for significant effects. 
Dr. Rich also said anecdotally, we often hear that runners who wear orthotics then transition to barefoot or minimalist running no longer need their orthotics, suggesting that arch height has increased. Their results did not support that theory whatsoever, that it takes longer than 10 weeks of beginning to run in minimalist running shoes before we see an effect on the arch height. That doesn't mean that it can't happen, it just means it's not going to happen within that 10 week period of time. Here's another study in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. 103 runners with neutral or mild pronation who were randomly assigned to either a Nike Pegasus, a traditional shoe, and by the way, just for the occasion today, I'm wearing my Nike 1080s, the traditional running shoe which I'm running in presently, and the traditional running shoe which I've run 25 marathons in for over 30 years. So the results, 99 runners were included in the final analysis with 23 injuries reported. The neutral shoe reported the fewest injuries, the partial minimalist shoe, 12 injuries, and the most. So runners in the full minimalist group reported great shin and calf pain. Running in the minimalist footwear appears to increase the likelihood of experiencing an injury, with full minimalist design specifically increasing at the shin and the calf. So those clinicians, or we as a society, should, ex should really exert caution with our runners, with our patients, particularly when they want to wear a minimalist type of foot gear, otherwise a new type of foot gear when they've been running in traditional foot gear for so long. And here's another interesting uh, article that I saw by these physical therapists and these uh, folks in clinical biomechanics Barefoot and running, uh, barefoot and barefoot inspired footwear as a treatment modality for running injuries as opposed to more conventional running shoes. 39 runners underwent 3D running analysis at 4 milliseconds, joint moments, <clears throat> the telephoto contact force and pressure and the Achilles tendon forces were compared. So what did we see? Did it help knees? Yes, it helped the knee, but what it did do, here as you can see, it caused an increase in Achilles tendon loading, which may induce an injury at the tendon, whether it's at the insertion, the mid-body, or the mild tendon disjunction. So let's say you're running in a Newton shoe. What happens with a Newton, with a Newton type of shoe? The forefoot posting encourages the runner to land on the forefoot or the midfoot. The forefoot posting creates a torsional fulcrum at the midfoot if the runner is not biomechanically sound. That's what I was trying to show in the very beginning of our presentation. The torsion appears to occur during the stance phase of the runner's gait. The midfoot of the minimalist shoe has a space or a gap between the heel and the higher forefoot posting. As the runner moves through pronation, this causes during that stance phase of gait a torsion or twisting which occurs at the midfoot causing a collapse in this gap. And if there's no part of the shoe making contact with the ground, you get a painful situation either at the mid-tarsal joint or at Liz Frank's joint. My friend Justin Wernick always used to say at the mid-stance phase of gait when the subtalar joint lines up, mid-tarsal joint and Liz Frank joint lines up, you want to create a, leap, a structural, sound, rigid lever arm of that medial column. Can you achieve that with this type of shoe or with barefoot running? That is the debate, that is the question. This unstable fulcrum at the midfoot combined with an underlying weakness or muscle imbalance can predispose a runner to an acute or repetitive stress injury. This torsion is magnified when the increased ground reactive forces of running are added. So, just this week you saw the article, uh, the guy from the American College of Sports Medicine. It's interesting enough that Nicholas and myself were both interviewed by the same lady from the Wall Street Journal, she didn't use our names, and she didn't use any podiatrists in the American College of Sports Medicine guide as well. But what she showed was, and I call this the uh, Lord of the Ring type of movie, we're looking for not just Middle Earth, we're looking for middle ground. So I'm one that compromises in a lot of things, particularly when it comes to this situation. Heel height differential, or the drop of more than six millimeters. We're trying to see this area drop so that we can bring those 